Hey, counselors, day five, day five. So here is the lovely Carrie, all the way from Canada. Yeah, these things take ages. We, um, we've we been planning this for about two months, three months, mm-hmm. probably six months if I didn't fluff the last version. <laughs> <laughs> but so thank you, Carrie, for spending five days with us. This is the last input of preparation for cruciate surgery. And that also applies to conservative management as well. So mm-hmm. Not going for surgery do not feel that you can't watch these they're still going to give you lots and lots of advice the reason it's on cam is because cruciate disease is a leading cause of stifle arthritis so by giving you guys good advice at the point of surgery you are going to get a longer term health plan for the oa okay so over to you carrie All right. Welcome back to day five. I'm sure you've all watched days one through four. And now we're going to finish off with a little massage. And I kind of, I feel like we all need a little massage right now in this this crazy (laughs) time that we're living in. So let's talk about massage. All right. Okay. Can you see my screen, Hannah? I can see your screen. Okay. Now, first of all, for the purposes of photos and the video I put the dog on a massage table because it's just easier to film it and biomechanically it's a little bit easier for me but at home I would not expect people to have a massage table so you can you do this wherever the dog is comfortable you can do it on the floor you can do it on the couch you can do it on the bed like whatever works for you as long as the dog has choice isn't it as long as yeah Dog says, I don't want to be rude to you and tell you off, but I would like to slip away from this because I'm not enjoying it. It's about making sure that you're really observant to what your dog is communicating with you. And um, there are some people that believe if the dog doesn't have an exit point, they're not going to be able to express themselves. So just consider that. Make sure that you're really aware of what your dog's saying to you. Mm -hmm. And not all dogs are going to like massage, right? Not all yeah. dogs are touchy feely. If you have a golden retriever, if you stop massaging, they're all, they're going to freak out. They they only want to be touched 100% of the time. If you have a Rottweiler, they may not be open to massage. So again, these are just techniques that can help your dog never stress your dog out, okay? So yeah. you're only going to do this if your dog kind of likes being touched. Um, it's just going to help sort of relax them and it's going to help sort of things with things like the swelling around the joints. So generally massage helps the dog to kind of relax. And so, yeah, tell us about how it works. What, what's the, what's the theory of what you're doing mm-hmm. with massage? So, so again, we've talked, we've talked to in the past about how, uh, surgery and injuries create swelling, create pain, create stiffness. And the, when you have swelling around a joint, so in this case, it's most of the swelling is going to be around the stifle joint or the knee joint. Um, the more we can help move that swelling away from the joint, the better the joint's going to be moving and the less pain that the dog is going to be in. So massage is an easy way to help circulation, help fluid be pushed away from the knee. When you have swelling in the leg, the swelling has to drain up through the hip now, because that's where all the lymph nodes are. And so when the dog is standing upright, the the swelling will actually drain down towards the the hawk rather than go against gravity being be pushed up to the hip. So that's why swelling can take a long time to go away. If you've ever injured your knee or your ankle, your, your physio will have told you you have to elevate, right? And you have yeah. to elevate above the level of your heart. So if you've got a sprained ankle, you've got your, you're going to get your foot way up in the air to really help that swelling drain towards your hip. Now, very difficult. I haven't found a way to get a dog to lie in his back with his leg elevated above the level of his heart. So if you have any tips on that, I would be happy to hear them. <laughs> But I have not found that to be the case. So a little bit of gentle, rhythmical movement helps sort of drain the swelling towards the lymphatic system in the hip. And it's, we're always, the direction of your massage is what's critical because we're always going to be massaging 
from the foot towards the hip. We never want to massage from the hip towards the foot. We always want to be thinking about the drainage point. So massage is going to help us push the fluid towards the drainage point. Um, good. So what about, what about um, so a lot of people talk about the potential that can influence muscle um, function and pain. Oh. And there's lots and lots of other things and just the actual physical contact can have mm. such a beneficial effect on the dog's cognitive and emotional state. So there's loads and loads of benefits to, to massage. Yeah. And we know touch does that, right? Even just any kind of touch helps. Yeah. And again, it helps that owner animal bond, right? Like, yeah. like you, you know, your dog is in pain. You don't like to see them in pain and it, and it helps you. You're going to get just as much benefit out of it as your dog, because you know you're helping your dog kind of get through something traumatic and they love it and it just they will ask for it you know they'll kind of cuddle up do dogs love touch i would say most dogs love touch and so you're through that sense of touch you're going to be just helping that whole emotional bond as well yeah definitely definitely so where are we kind of looking at throwing our massage hands what's what's the kind of thought process the thought so we're sorry i missed that i was that's not right paying attention um, to you. i was playing with my dog five. no my we're day five we've been here so long we're beginning to lose the will um, no, seriously, so, my dog just pushed his nose up into my hand and i'm petting him right now so. <laughs> that's all right so when people whenever we talk about interventions i think it's normal for the public to go right we're going to be focusing this on the leg the problem leg and i think takes a little bit of an expansion of the mind that actually these hands might be very distant to the leg and still doing a huge amount of good so can you exactly okay because the thing about um massage and touch is it also works on the the brain and the central nervous system and so if your dog has an angry red swollen infected leg you're not going to you're not going to want to touch that they're not going to want you to touch that but if you can get up and do these sort of techniques on the front limbs and the opposite limb even just stroking along the back all of that sort of helps relax tension it relaxes the spinal muscles the dog can breathe better you know they they're just their whole body sent you know can kind of settle down uh, the, I think the best time for massage again is sort of before bed because you don't want to get them all kind of relaxed and then go out for a, for a walk, right? Like yeah. you want them to stay settled. The whole point is to help, you know, help the function of the leg and reduce some of the swelling. And so we don't want to go from a nice lying down uh, position where we've helped to drain some of the swelling right to upright active walking again, because that's going to just make that swelling kind of gravitate back towards the, towards the stifle. Yeah, definitely. And I think going back to what we said in day four, there's going to be people and um, surgeons out there that are a little bit hesitant about owners being hands on. We talked about it with passive range of motion and there's going to be surgeons going, well, I don't know how experienced you are and you're going to be handling tissues around my delicate surgery. You don't actually need to apply the massage to the leg. This concept still could be in other parts of the body. And if you're you're quite a hesitant person, like I know my mum would be like, oh my God, I can't touch the leg. I could do harm. You're like, you really won't. But if you're that worried, concentrate your attention to the base of the neck, around the shoulders, between the shoulder blades, because these are all areas that are going to be taking more weight. And oh, because of that increased load placed upon them, they're going to start having their own secondary problems. So mm. you harm taking these principles elsewhere if you're a little bit hesitant or you've been forewarned not to touch the limb yep and you can use all of these same strokes just replace the front leg with the back leg so uh look at the elbow as the knee kind of thing and and it's still going to be the same direction it's going to be the same pressure and that's a good way to get started again it helps your dog relax right yeah, so definitely. even if you don't you've got a big bandage on and you can't actually access the leg because you may not be able to access the leg in some cases then do this on on the other side and do this on the front limbs so yes. you know you're not going to ever hurt anything kind of on a normal joint that hasn't had surgery and it will help just getting that touch and that bond and that relaxation to help make your dog more comfortable yeah and you can use it pre-surgery mm -hmm. 
conservative as well. So yeah. I know that this five days was talking about prepping for surgery and we've kind of bounced over the border into post-surgery and we're back in pre-surgery. These concepts are applicable across the board. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the plan. So yeah. anything else to add? Just yeah, even if you haven't had surgery, like you said, like this can this can help a cons- sort of conservative treatment, but also you know, six months after surgery, your dog may still really like this massage. So this is something you could keep doing forever if you want, if your dog likes it. Um, And then start doing both sides, do the front, do the back. Like if you've had a big, you know, uh, hike in the, in the woods and you've come back and the dog's kind of, you might be a little bit sore because you've been out for five hours, then give them a little bit of massage like this. So that, that always feels good. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's, It's kind of nice to see that there is definitely a more open mindedness to these interventions. I think um, 10 years ago, I definitely found that my colleagues were like, what? This Mm -hmm. can't do no good. (laughs) (laughs) And very pharmaceutically focused. But now very much I feel that we are embracing these um, integrated approaches, aren't we? Because we've been doing it in humans for thousands of years. Let's start, thousands. Sharing these, let's start sharing these techniques with our dogs. So we're going to go to an amazing video. And uh, we'll talk to you after the amazing video. Perfect. See you in five. Okay, let's get started with a nice massage. We're going to start with some long, slow, easy, rhythmical strokes along your dog's back. Just to get them to relax a little bit. I prefer sort of to be behind the dog like I am here, but you can be in whatever position suits you the best. You can also have your dog flat on the floor or up on an elevated surface. It doesn't matter. Again, whatever is most comfortable for you. Our second stroke is going to be a nice, long, easy stroke. And this has quite light pressure from the toes right up to the hip. So remember we talked about We want to drain any swelling up towards the hip. So our strokes are always nice and slow and rhythmical from the toes towards the hip. Next, go towards the back of the dog's leg. Again, the direction is toes towards the hip and just a nice easy stroke uh, from the heel kind of towards the bum. You see I'm kind of starting above that kind of pointy heel bone. So nice light pressure. And I would do about five strokes on each area. Next we'll go to the front. Now we want to stay away from the incision. If your dog has a bandage, then just uh, work around the bandage. And I like to go just from the top of the knee here and up towards the front of the hip. So again, five strokes, very rhythmical. And now we want to get the surface of the inside of the hip. These are the adductor muscles. And this is where the lymph nodes are. And so this is where a lot of the drainage is going to happen. I like to use the edge of my thumb for this one because the stroke is just from the knee towards the groin and you see how I'm I'm resting the dog's knee in my hand because we just want to support that knee joint at all times. Now we're going to start kind of a kneading motion. It's not really a pinch but just sort of a gentle knead where you're sort of squeezing your thumb into your fingers and we're going to work again in that same direction from the heel bone right up through the gastroc muscles. This is the calf muscle. That gets very tight um, with the injury and post-op. And then we want to come up into the hamstring here. So just a nice, again, rhythmical, comfortable kneading motion. Remember, massage should be very comfortable for your dog. As you do the massage, your dog should be kind of relaxing. Often they'll just close their eyes and fall asleep. So it should be very comforting for them. Not all dogs like massage. So if your dog is giving you signs that he doesn't like it, like he's looking at you with these sideways eyes or he's kind of nudging your hands to stop, then just stop the massage. We always want this to be a positive experience for the dog. 
So now our next muscle that we're going to need is the quadricep muscle. So we're going to work from the front of the leg, so from the top of the knee right up towards the groin area. And you can see how I'm just kind of digging in there with my hands. It's very soft still. The pressure is very loose and relaxed. Uh, it's not bothering Sassy here at all. But this nice kind of pressure on the muscle and you often feel some ropiness in the muscle here so it helps to kind of get rid of those ropey knots. Again I like to do everything in fives for massage so five long strokes, five kneading strokes. After we finish the kneading we're going to go back to five long strokes to kind of finish this off. So again direction is important. We're going to go from the toes to the hips we're going to work the outside of the leg, then the back of the leg, and next I'll go to the front of the leg. So just sort of helping all of that drainage. And then we'll finish off those strokes again on the inside of the leg. And again, make sure you're supporting the knee joint with your hand. And I find the thumb is the easiest way to get in here and work that groin. And then at the very end, a few strokes again, just a longer back, just to finish everything off and make her feel good. Hey guys, we're back. So how was it? Do you feel all relaxed now? <laughs> you know, you can try it on your own leg too. Probably will help. You know, my knee, I have a bit of our... I know what all this knee. was. I didn't... We'll all feel all loosey-goosey. Yeah. Amazing. So hopefully you guys are thinking... Wow, I'm not so scared about what's going to happen. You know, you've got the surgery coming up or you've got conservative management ahead. You've got some tools in your toolbox, which is what mm. it's going to be. It's not the comprehensive all singing, all guide. We still would suggest that if you can see a physiotherapist or a rehab practitioner, game on. Yes. But there's a lot of people that follow CAM that might not have the facilities near them. They might not be so prevalent in their country. This is hopefully going to give you a few tips. But we're going to just review it all now. You've got a checklist for us, haven't you? I do. So kind of what I finish off my the guide with is this checklist. And so um, if you can get a checklist that you sort of put up on the fridge or the wall, you know, we were talking before about like little sticky notes, it's just easier to follow where you should be in your program. So uh, in this checklist, we want to see things like what medication should you be on? So obviously your, your vet is going to be writing this part of your checklist. So what medication, just sort of a good reminder, when does it finish? Um, you know, there are often multiple medications that they're maybe on at the first few days. Hannah, you might be able to talk about that for a second. Yeah, yeah. So it's really common for these dogs to come home on potentially a couple of um, different medications. So we've always got our foundational non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And some of these need a little bit of extra pain relief. And that might be in the form of a synthetic kind of opioid like tramadol. And um, that's losing a little bit of favor. And um, then others might be focusing more on like a PARD LV paracetamol. Some dogs might already be on an adjunct and they might be on it for a while, such as amantadine and gabapentin. It, it really depends on your dog and the experience your dog is going through, the surgery that they have and the experience of the veterinary professional in charge of the case. But it's very, very, very unlikely that your dog won't be on some form of medication. Mm -hmm, exactly. And it can get confusing, right? If you're an owner, and you don't know which medication is for what. So sometimes just having this all written down, you know, physically on a piece of paper will help you every morning go, okay, this is for this and this is for that. And this is when they need to take that. And so just, totally just, just kind of collate everything and make it a little bit easier. Um, yeah. So, so do you need a sling for walking? Has your vet recommended that they need a harness or that they don't need anything at all? Or do you need to go get your shopping bag? So you want to know that ahead of time. Yeah. When is your next follow-up visit? It's like, you don't want to be two weeks in and going, oh, do I have to make an appointment? Or when is the visitor do like, there's not always staples. There's not always stitches. Every, you know, surgeon is a little bit different. So when is your first follow-up visit? Uh, and have that book now. And also what we do in our practice is we, as, as soon as the dog is booked for surgery, 
we book their first rehab appointment at the same time. So that would be kind of considered a follow-up visit as well. So when is, when is your first rehab appointment if you're seeing anyone who's sort of specializing in rehab? Um, yeah. When is your, next, your x-ray, right? Because a lot of yeah. times if you're having a TPLO or a TTA, you're going to have a follow-up x-ray somewhere between the six and eight week mark. So again, have that booked ahead of time so that you know when it is. So all yeah. of this. And I love the place. milestones. I think um, this is another really, really important part is that you need to be speaking to your vet, your, your therapist, your surgeon and say, what are the goals that I am looking to achieve? At what point should my dog be nearly fully weight bearing? At what mm point should my dog be able to walk with less of a limp you know because we all know with covid at the moment months are going past that i just don't even know that i experienced time is just warped yeah i think it can be very easy to be suddenly four or five weeks post surgery and you're not really aware that that time has passed and your dog is still only toe touching lame so having some milestones to flag up when things are not going according to plan is a really good idea too mm-hmm. exactly uh, and milestones like when when can you start doing stairs? Because sometimes in the commotion of, you know, booking the surgery and picking up your dog, you may not have time to ask those questions. And in COVID, you may not be in the clinic. So, um, you know, these milestones about when you can start doing things like stairs are a big one. And when can your dog go off leash? And so um, in my practice, we usually say not till eight weeks because we want that surgical or that... Um, follow up x-ray to make sure that bone is healed before we start trusting the dog to be able to go off leash. What are your thoughts on that? No, I I totally agree. And I think it's one of those such a simple things. It really isn't a, a hardship. You're still with your dog. You're still having a quality of life with them, keeping them on the lead and just changing what your expectations of that walk is, is not difficult. Is it? And when you look at the repercussions of not doing that, they're huge. You really are back into surgery yeah exactly uh and then you someone will have probably be been giving you some exercises to start so uh there are usually weekly exercises and so even though you're on leash outside you're still spending a lot of time with your dog inside because most of these exercises are strengthening or or range of motion exercise and they are all can be done in your living room. So yes. you're still getting a lot of this one-on-one exercise time with your dog. It's just not the way you used to do it uh, while you're rehabbing. Yeah, and, and we had talked earlier about, um, you know, being able to deal with the owners and making sure you have good owner compliance. So what we ask them to do is we, we have these, this, these checklists printed and I ask them to bring them in. And then I can see if they've checked off their exercises. Oh, we, oh, we, have a checklist. <laughs> we have a checklist for every week's exercises and, and they put it on their fridge and then they check off when they did their exercises. So if they bring, if they conveniently forget to bring it in or, you know, they, br- they kind of will say, oh, you know what? I haven't been, I haven't been very good this week. You know, I didn't do any of my exercises. And we're like, well, we kind of expect that. But that's why you've got these lists so that you can actually physically see it every day. Right. So ask them to be and and that makes them um, responsible. Right. For being part of their dog's care. Yeah, definitely. So don't be shy of the pen and paper, guys. Get it written down. Um, Amazing. Absolutely. Mm. Amazing. We're so lucky to have people like you willing to give your time and energy and enthusiasm. My pleasure. As I would say, most owners don't have access to people like you or myself or anyone who's actually doing rehab because it is it's very few and far between right now. And so, yeah. uh, so the, if we can at least get this out to some owners who don't have access to anyone, it gives them an idea of what they can do to help that. So it's a, so that the surgery is a success, right? That's the whole point is your dog goes back to being your normal dog again. Yeah. And I think it's also inspiring people to even go and look for it. So they might have these services in and about, but they've never really seen the importance of them. So hopefully you feel inspired. You're now going to be putting in the thread below this, can anybody tell me if there's a physio in South yeah. <laughs> That's great. But, um, that, that's yeah. what we want you to do. 
That's what we want you to do. So hopefully you've enjoyed this. We're going to get Carrie back because she's just wonderful. Awesome. Wonderful. Awesome. I would be happy to come back and start sharing some exercises if Hannah wants me to. Oh, my God. I love that. Maybe we'll talk about that next time. We will talk about that. (laughs) Till then, guys. uh, See you later. Stay safe. Stay happy. COVID will be over soon.